As we turn to the 142nd Psalm, we're coming to the minor key, as it were. Most of the Bible is kind of in the major key, the great triumphant faith of Noah, uh, Enoch standing alone in the whole world, David uh, facing Goliath, uh, the incredible faith of the early church standing against all odds. That's all the major key. It's kind of the triumphant going forth. But in the 142nd Psalm, we have revealed the other part, the kind of the parallel track that goes through life, and that's the minor key. That's the, the confession of the frailty, the feebleness, the humanness of this man who is after God's own heart. Basically, the seventh verse says this, uh, Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will surround me for you shall deal bountifully with me. The NIV says, set me free from my prison. Uh, The New American follows the same track as the New King James, bring my soul out of prison. This, This cave that David had gotten into was a literal cave. It was a physical cave, but the relentless pursuit of Saul, King Saul, the the entrance of all these hundreds of malcontents and the fact that that David was basically stuck with them brought David to the point where his soul, his emotions, where the part of him that interfaced with his body had come to what we would call depression. The word for prison literally is the word for smith, blacksmiths. He said, I am... Shackled, I am imprisoned, I am locked in here. My soul is. Now what's interesting is that the scriptures don't say that that was sinful. In fact, you're going to see this morning that this is a common feeling of God's saints. And they're never condemned or rebuked for it, just invited to come out of it and not to persist there. That brings us to the wonderful question, what do Paul and Ezra, and Hezekiah, and Job, and Elijah, and Moses, and Jeremiah, and Jonah, and David, all have in common. It's the same thing that they share with us. Each of those, and a whole galaxy of other saints, were all spirit-filled servants of the Lord. And yet they all struggled with, if we look closely in the Scripture, with reoccurring, lifelong, what we would call negative emotions. Let me go back through that list. Paul, Ezra, Hezekiah, Job, Elijah, Moses, Jeremiah, Jonah, David, and many more. Now, usually we don't think that those two tracks are supposed to be present. You're supposed to just be up here on the the major key all the time, the triumphal, fearless, face anything and burn at the stake mode. But a question we need to answer this morning from God's word is, can believers struggle with emotional problems and still be spirit-filled believers? Aren't those two mutually non-coexisting in the spiritual realm? I looked up uh, just one word this morning in Webster's Dictionary because we use it so much. And uh, it's just the word depression. And here's the fascinating Dictionary definition, a state of feeling sad. Hmm. You ever felt sad? Is it a sin to feel sad? A disorder marked especially by sadness, inactivity, difficulty, and thinking, and and having trouble concentrating. Actually, I find that before my first cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, So I kept reading. Uh, A significant increase or decrease in appetite and time spent sleeping. Now we get into the emotional, the feelings of dejection, hopelessness, and sometimes suicidal tendencies. So I guess that's where the negative side of depression comes. Then I read the second, that was the first, that's the primary definition. The secondary one is a reduction of activity. I thought, is that bad? You know, the older we get, the slower we go. A reduction in the amount, the quality, or the force or vitality of our activity. And I thought that's just part of life. So we must be careful not to say that anxiety, depression, discouragement, and many other negative emotions are in themselves sin. 
We have to be very careful about that because it's hard enough to go through life as it is with all that the lusts of the flesh and the pride of life brings us to not classify all of the attending weaknesses of our frailty as sinful because we see these same emotions in God's servants. In fact, we see the same emotions in Christ. I guess that's what's the most arresting about this. We see in Christ anger that is not sin. Deep emotional distress and grief and anguish, all of which were perfectly displayed because we know he wasn't sinning. But the Greek words that describe his emotions are in other places describing what we often attribute to believers as sin. So is it possible to have those emotions without being sinful? That's that's a real good study. Jesus, in coming to earth, took upon himself the form of a human with all of its frailties, yet he did not sin. The key is not to call each occurrence of a negative emotion sin. The key is not to stay there. That is what David explains to us, and if this 142nd Psalm is well understood, it is David's confession of how he did not allow all the circumstances that had emotionally brought him down, he did not allow those to make him sin against the Lord that he loved. The Christian who remains in sadness and depression really breaks a commandment in some direction or other because he mistrusts God. His power, his providence, and his forgiveness. But just the mere presence of those emotions is not, in and of itself, sin. Now let's open in God's Word, starting back in Numbers. I'm going to take you on a quick view of these men I listed. And I want to show you their emotions, okay? Numbers 11. And as we open God's Word, I want you to look how these key servants of the Lord that I rattled off at the beginning all suffered from crippling and sometimes even paralyzing negative emotions. And what's amazing is that the inspired, superintending Word of God with the Holy Spirit breathing through those who recorded it does not choose to immediately go, Ah, that was sin. Oh, that one was sin too. That one was sin too. It just describes this as a part of their lives. Starting in Numbers 11, verses 14 and 15, Moses is confessing this. He said, I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. Verse 15, if you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. If I found favor in your sight, do do not let me see my wretchedness. Now, what Moses was confessing is that he humanly could not do what had to be done. Now, yes, that's true. He needed to rely on the Lord. But coming to the end of himself was actually a blessing when he got squashed and pressed and what we would call depressed by his work because he went on to trust the Lord more fully. Keep going to the right to 1 Kings 19. I want to show you a second one. 1 Kings 19 is Elijah. In verse 4, And Elijah, as you know, was often in the major key. I mean, this fellow stood alone against an entire nation, against an entire army. In fact, he stood alone against the most heinous and wicked of all the the corrupt religious people of the day, Jezebel, whose name is synonymous with sin and the occult and wickedness. But after all that, after his greatest time of victory, 1 Kings 19 verse 4 talks about Elijah's downside his he got down but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die this is after mount carmel this is after having all the the prophets of baal destroyed this is after running a foot race with a chariot and beating it i mean we're talking about supernatural courage strength faith and and ability but after all that He heard a rumor that Jezebel was going to get him, and so he prayed that he might die. And he said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. I would say he was definitely down. You know, it's interesting the Lord doesn't rebuke him for that. We're going to see tonight when we 
look a little more in depth at his life, that the Lord rather rested him and fed him because there were physical reasons for his emotional state of complete discouragement. And the Lord dealt first with the physical causes before he brought to bear the spiritual lesson he needed to learn, which is a very significant sequence from the Lord. Go to 2 Kings chapter 20. Keep going to the right. 2 Kings chapter 20. We've done Moses, Elijah. Here's Hezekiah. Hezekiah got sick. And uh, it was a deadly illness. So 2 Kings 20, verses 2 and 3. When he got word, he turned his face to the wall. Kind of a good sign things weren't good, you know. Someone, If you're talking to someone, they just turn away from you and put their nose in the corner. They might be troubled. And um, he didn't like this, this prognosis or diagnosis. And he prayed the Lord and he said, Remember, Lord, I have walked before you in truth with a loyal heart and I have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. See, Hezekiah was very, very grieved and sad and depressed, you would call it. He, his normal activities ceased, as Webster says, and he just put his face in the wall, and he was very sad. And, of course, you know what the Lord did? The Lord responded to that prayer and added 15 years to his life. But it's interesting that he doesn't say that what he did was wrong. The Lord was just patient and gentle with him, seeing him process all this. Now, keep going to the right to Job. First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. And look at chapter 3. You know this one well. Verse 11. Job asks this question. Uh, as he's going through such bitter anguish and, and duress and, and horrific times, he says in verse 11, Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? He said, I, I cannot go on. I am completely unable to go on. I wish I could die. He's, that's pretty down. Okay, next book. Go to the right to Psalm, uh, the 119th Psalm. And let's look at Ezra. There's a stellar personality. Uh, tradition records and, and non Church history, actually pre-church history, records that Ezra had the entire Old Testament memorized. You, you know, some of us are memorizing verses. How would you like to have down 939 chapters like that? He wrote one whole chapter himself. Uh, and another 10 chapters are about him. So, wow, this guy was amazing. But look at his testimony in the 119th Psalm, verse 25. He says this, My soul clings to the dust. In fact, if you study closely the 119th Psalm, which is his testimony, it is filled with many occurrences of his constant struggles with people, with his emotions. And right here, he summarizes all. He says, my soul clings to the dust. And then he gives one of those wonderful prayer requests we looked at for a whole year when we went through the 119th Psalm. And he says, revive me. Now he knew the only hope and source of of strength to go through this was the Lord. But he doesn't say, in my wicked sinfulness, I am clinging to the dust. He just said, that's how life is. Keep going to the 142nd Psalm, where we started this morning. And in that context, let me read to you David's confession. David says in 142.7, Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. He's saying, I'm so squashed, I'm so discouraged and depressed, I can't even praise you, Lord, rescue me. The righteous shall surround me. He said, I'm with all these malcontents, and you'll deal bountifully with me. He said, bring my soul out of prison. Okay, keep going to Lamentations, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. Lamentations, uh, chapter 1 and verse 20. This is uh, Jeremiah's confession. We've looked many times at him. He's such a rich source of hope. Uh, Jeremiah confesses in Lamentation 120, a very beautiful declaration. See, O Lord, that I am in distress. I, my soul is troubled. My heart is overturned within me. For I have been very rebellious 
Now what's he talking about? He didn't, he didn't like what he saw happening to Jerusalem. This is his testimony. He's, a, he's kind of a CNN, on-the-spot news correspondent, watching Nebuchadnezzar destroying the city and the people of Jerusalem being butchered. And he's writing about the smoke rising and the, the carcasses piled in piles at the end of each street. And he says, I, I am not with you in this. I don't like what's going on. He says, I, I am by that rebellion. It doesn't mean he's, he's fighting against the Lord. He just is not accepting of what the Lord is doing. And so that has caused him to be in distress and his soul was troubled and his heart was overturned. He said, outside the sword bereaves and at home it's like death. Jeremiah was truly struggling at this time. Well, keep going to the end of the Minor Prophets, Jonah. So it goes Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. There it is. Chapter 4, verse 8. This incredibly uh, empowered prophet of the Lord who had the Lord rescue him from death in the midst of the sea, uh, who, who saw through his evangelistic ministry probably the single greatest evangelistic impact that anyone has ever had. Uh, this city had hundreds of thousands of people, and they all turned to the Lord in repentance. And look what Jeremiah responds with, in Jer- or, I mean Jonah, in Jonah 4 and verse 8. This is Jonah's testimony, and it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind. The sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself. And continue in the verse and said, it's better for me to die than to live. I mean, after all that incredible ministry, he crashes. And finally, let's go to the New Testament because we're going to stay there. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And we're going to go through Paul's life a little bit. But I want to start in 2 Corinthians 7. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, verses 5 and 6. And I'm going to read this uh, fifth and sixth verse in the New American Standard just because it pulls out uh, with clarity this one word I want to show you. 2 Corinthians 5, or 7, verse 5. For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. Paul Paul struggled with fear, but God hath not given us a spirit of fear, he told Timothy. That's because Timothy struggled with fear too. We are not to persist in fear. We cannot stop fears from being within. But he doesn't stop there. Verse 6, but God who comforts, and New American Standard rightly translates this word beautifully, look at this, the depressed comforted us. What was Mr. Major Key, Mr. Uh, you know, stand against every mob, Mr. get beaten with rods, Mr. stone to death and come back to life? What was he going through right here? He was depressed. Was that a sin? No. That was a common result of what he was going through. Look what he says before that. He said, our flesh had no rest. If you know anything about where he was, he was in the most Roman of the Roman Empire. He was just coming from Asia Minor, where, where the, the pagan idolatry and emperor worship and everything else that was so strong that he was constantly being pursued. So he was weary. And, and, and the, the fear for his life, which is a very part of our frame and our fabric, he, he was buffeted with those conflicts and fears, and he was depressed. But he didn't persist in that. What does he say? But God who comforts the depressed. He said, I am, but God who comforts me comforted us by the coming of Titus. Now it's interesting. This man wrote the Bible, had also mastered much of the Old Testament, who had written enough books, I'm sure he knew the books he'd written, but he was comforted by what? Another believer coming to him. And we're going to see that a little later, that sometimes uh, we need the ministry of other believers. Well, have God's servants fared any better than these from the Bible over the past centuries? 
I mean, do we have any, since the apostolic times in the Old Testament great spirit-filled servants that made it without ever having a down day? They just kind of lived the, the triumphant Christian life, the Christian secret of a happy life, as Hannah Whittall Smith wrote the book. Always? Well, let's look at some of the most well-known. The great hymn we all love to sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, was penned by the great 16th century reformer Martin Luther during the darkest year of his life. Check the year, 1527. You can even read in the encyclopedia that that year was the year that Martin Luther was utterly, utterly in anguish, emotional angst. I mean, he has an uh, angst affection nut. You know, some German word he made up. You know how the Germans put words together and, and form words with by putting them all together and joining them. He made a word up for the utter anguish of his soul that he felt that year. And then he wrote his testimony to God's power to lift him out of the prison of his soul and back to hope and strength. And that testimony that he wrote in 1527, we sing about. And sometimes we sing it in the major key. He was singing it in the minor key. He was saying, I had to flee for refuge to Christ because my flesh, my body, my earthly life, not in sin, just in weakness, was constantly in anguish. And so he wrote this. He was a devoted pastor. He sought to bring spiritual counsel to struggling souls. His compassion for those souls as a pastor, Martin Luther, shines in many places. His sermons, his lectures, his Bible commentaries, his table talks. But when he wrote this hymn, he didn't just talk about observing mental difficulties in his parishioners. Luther had a greater reason to affirm the reality of what he struggled with. It's because he endured many periods of darkness in his life. And temptation and struggles with negative emotions, he concludes, are not sin. Kind of what you could conclude also from the New Testament. This is how Luther described his personal experience, his Christian life. He said, these are the varied terms I would describe often my life. Now, this is a man that translated the whole Bible into the language of the people, into the German language. This is a man that single-handedly, by God's grace, turned the tide of, of the darkness of Romanism and actually put the light up and shined it on the Scriptures and turned the tide, what we call the Reformation, getting back the, the heart of salvation, uh, the justification by faith and, and our adherence to the Scriptures. This is how he described his life. Melancholy, heaviness, Depression, dejection of spirit, downcast of heart, sad, and downhearted. And by the way, his most renowned uh, uh, commentator on his life that wrote uh, biographies of him, uh, Bainton, said this, This occurred through most of his life, and these struggles show up continually in his works, but he did not think it a shameful problem to be hidden. Rather, he shared it so that the saints could come beside him and encourage him. And that's what Martin Luther's life is a testimony of. Not hidden in a cloistered cell going through his angafectum, as he called it, but the saint sharing with other saints his need for their compassion and help. Uh, so there's one. Let's go forward 400 years. How about the famous preacher I've mentioned many times, Charles Spurgeon? He lit the fires of the 19th century revival movement. But he struggled so severely with depression that he was forced to be absent from his pulpit often two to three months each year. If you collect his sermons, as I have done, and have all those Metropolitan and Park Street uh, Chapel sermons, you find the gaps. Because he was so struggling. In fact, in 1866, at the age of 32, as he was crescendoing in his worldwide fame for his ministry, this is what he told his congregation. I am the subject of depressions of spirit so fearful I hope none of you ever get to such extremes of wretchedness as I go to. And he left the pulpit and laid down and didn't come back for three months. And there is a man who knew the Bible in and out. In fact, he truly had a photographic mind. People say they do. He knew the contents of all 25,000 volumes in his library. I've been in his library. It's still there in his church. And they, they've enshrined it. And there are a lot of books that they're the only copy in the world of those books. And 
Charles Haddon Spurgeon could tell you the, the book, the page number, and the place on the page where things were. And he often did that. And he knew the Bible that way. And yet he was a subject of such depressions of spirit, so fearful. I hope none of you ever go to the extremes of wretchedness as I go to. So if it's learning more verses, if it's knowing more doctrine, if it's having more truth, then it's impossible to make it because he had about the max. How about the man that succeeded him in fame? Uh, the, he was the next great preacher after Spurgeon. He was called the greatest preacher in the English-speaking world. Uh, he, he came into the 20th century. His name was John Henry Jowett. He preached in the leading churches of the world. He preached to huge congregations. He would be like some of our great radio preachers today and, and great uh, commentators that we know about. And he wrote books that were always bestsellers as they hit the, the presses. This is what he said in one of his sermons. You seem to imagine I have no ups and downs, but just a level and lofty stretch of spiritual attainment with unbroken joy and equanimity? By no means. I am often perfectly wretched of soul, and everything appears most murky. Do you ever feel murky? Then join the crowd. That's what most of those great servants of God in the Old Testament that write about their lives went through. And that's what the stellar luminaries that have led the way in doctrine and in preaching have felt. I could go on and on through the who's who of ministry and find countless other testimonies that say the same. So to answer our question, it would be a definite yes. Spirit-filled Christians can experience emotional problems, and some godly believers will always struggle with being down. They are minor through life. In many cases, as we look back on history, we can conclude that many of these saints suffered because of physical conditions that prompted depression. What I love to read as I read is all the doctors that analyze these guys, and they say, well, what Luther had was, you know, severe gout. And if he would have taken our, you know, you know vitamin supplement and cut down on the wine, you know, and, and they just kind of rehearsed, but he didn't and he couldn't. And... What's interesting is, I found this, one Christian medical doctor who was looking at all these people and who spent his lifetime as a layperson in a church counseling and helping people wrote this, and this is fascinating. I, I had to think about it a long time. This is what this doctor wrote. Consider this thought. Give me the most saintly person you know, and if I was to administer to them certain medications of the right dosage, and he gives just a few examples, and the only one I recognized is thyroid hormone or insulin. And I leave out all the other ones, he said. I could virtually guarantee that I could make this saint depressed with any one of these agents. And then he asked this. Would such a chemically induced anxiety be explained as spiritual sin? And then he goes on to say, what if the person's own body had an abnormal amount of, say, thyroid hormone or insulin and produced the same effect? Very interesting thought. Well, we as believers should never condone willful sin, but we must learn to accept that some fellow believers may suffer from emotional symptoms that are not the result of personal unconfessed sin. And it is not helpful to immediately club someone when you meet an Elijah running and sitting and sucking their thumb, as Howard Hendricks says, having a pity potty party, as, as how he likes to put it, under a broom tree somewhere. You don't have to take out a bat and say, confess, boom, confess, boom, or you'll never feel better. Because God didn't do that. What did he do? He fed him and rested him and encouraged him and then told him there's more than what you're going through. Well, let's go to uh, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'm going to take you on a little journey. On the way, it's possible to feel as horrible and to be as great emotional anguish and still be obedient to the Lord as we saw in Job. As we look at Paul's life, let me read to you how Job describes what Paul was going through. Job says, I cannot eat for my sighing. My groans pour out like water. My life flies by day after day hopelessly. I hate my life, for God has ground me down. He has taken away my family. I search in vain. I seek him here. I seek him there. I cannot find him. My heart is broken. Depression haunts my days. My weary nights are filled with pain. I cry to you, O God, but you don't answer. Hmm. 
That's Job's testimony. Let's look at a modern-day Job in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. And this is what Paul says in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians in verse 8. 2 Corinthians 1, 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble, which came to us in Asia. That's modern-day Turkey, by the way. Remember I told you it's more Roman than Rome itself. There are more temples in Asia, Turkey, than there are in Italy. There's more Greek stuff in Turkey than there is in Greece. It was, the, it was the center of the Roman Empire. And that's where he was, facing the hatred for the gospel. And it says, continuing in verse 8, that we were burdened beyond measure. You ever heard the term hyperbole? Hyperbole is a Greek word. We've brought it into English. That's the word right there, measure. Burden beyond measure. He says, we were weighed down beyond, he uses the Greek word for beyond, hyperbole. Hyperbole means in Greek, same thing it does in English. It's kind of like speaking in the, the biggest terms possible. And so what he says is, we were, we were burdened beyond what is measurable. The greatest number possible. So he's saying, I, I have it more intense than I can measure. Above strength, he says, I don't have any dunamis left for the preaching of the cross, you know, is those that per is to those foolishness to those that perish, but to us who believe it's the dunamis of God. He says, I don't even have any dunamis right now. He says, it's above my dunamis, my strength. And I, or he says, we despaired even of life. You know, it's interesting. There are ten different words for suffering in the Greek language. Paul uses five of them in this little section. He exhausts the Greek language for the anguish, the struggle, the emotional, physical, and spiritual affliction he was going through. Most frequently, he uses the word thlipsis, which means narrowness, confinedness, and being under constant pressure. Paul's emotions were responding to his circumstances. He felt hemmed in by difficulties, and the only way he could look was up. See, that's the key. It's not accusing him of sin for being down. It's, it's learning from him that he didn't deny the down. He shared his struggles. But he said, the only way I'm making it and not letting this kill me is I'm looking up. But he still was depressed and discouraged and flipsist, squashed. Looking up didn't take it all away. It just gave him enough strength to go through it. And I think maybe that's a disservice we have, that we tell people you come to Christ and whew, everything is great. You fizzy all the time, you know? Kind of like dropping those fizzies in your drink. You know, the kids love them. They just bubble up all the time. And if you're not bubbly, there's some sin. Really, it isn't that way in the Bible. It doesn't say bubbly is godly. It says having peace, having hope, having strength through all this. So as believers, our joy is internal. And like our hope, it's from above. Even though Paul was discouraged by his circumstances, he still had spiritual joy. Now, see, I think that's, that's where we check out sometimes. We equate our joy and happiness with circumstances, and Paul detached them from his circumstances. His circumstances caused his body and his emotions to be squashed and weighed down, and his spirit had a choice, and that was that he was going to look up. But it didn't change his emotions. It didn't change how he felt. It just produced enduring hope. In fact, discouragement seems to attack the successful more than the unsuccessful. For the higher we climb, often we can fall further down. We're not surprised then when we read that the great apostle was pressed out of measure in this verse. He despaired even of going on with life. Great as Paul was in all of his spiritual maturity, he was still human like the rest of us. Look at uh, chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, because when Paul, when Paul did a spiritual inventory of his emotions, he states, um, his, he, he gives a description of his emotions, kind of like a battlefield, as if he was besieged and battered, and he had no earthly escape. That's 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9. This is what Paul says as he does a... Uh, a description of his emotions at the moment. He says, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. What that means, by the way, these are beautiful words, and in Greek they rhyme. They're, they're very interesting words. He, he was a, a brilliant communicator, and he used words that, that 
paralleled each other, that, that had a beautiful cadence to them. As, as you read them, it, it would be kind of like saying we're surrounded but not cut off. And he was using military terms. He says we're completely surrounded, but the one place they can't surround us is up, and we're not cut off. But he didn't say that, that he was freed from being completely surrounded, from being, as he said, hard-pressed on every side. Continuing in verse 8, we are perplexed but not in despair. We're pressed at every side but not abandoned by God. And, and again, he uses these incredible terms. And he says that, that we, uh, every, everything seems to be cut off, but we're not cut off from the one place that matters. Verse 9, persecuted but not forsaken. We're at the end of our rope, but we're not out of hope. You know, if you could kind of make stuff rhyme like that. And that's what he does in the Greek language. He says, we are persecuted. They're, they're pursuing us with, with, with danger to us, but we are not forsaken. We have our hope in God. And finally, he says, we're struck down, but not destroyed. Good way to rhyme it in English. We're knocked down, but we're not knocked out. He said, we keep getting knocked down. He didn't deny it. He didn't say that it was wrong. He didn't say that, that you know, if he'd have knew, known a couple more verses, it wouldn't have happened. He says, we are knocked down, but we're never destroyed. Uh, Paul said this in Romans 9. I mean, if you think it's only in, in 2 Corinthians. He says, we have great sorrow and unceasing grief over the plight of unbelieving Israel. No matter what his emotional state or his circumstances, Paul always knew God was in control, but knowing God was in his control did not change his emotional state. Do you understand that? You gotta notice that. That, that it isn't like there's some extra verse you can learn which will make everything, whew, it just doesn't happen for him. It's just that internal joy. Well, the mighty Paul was depressed. Paul did not deny the way he felt, nor does God want us to deny our emotions. Because of this spiritual transparency and honesty, Paul was never ashamed to ask Christians to pray for him. In fact, if you look, at least in seven of Paul's epistles, he gives specific areas of his life that he asks Christians to pray, and he confesses his struggles. In fact, he calls himself a soon agonizomai, a soon athletes, soon means with, and he said, I'm a fellow contender and struggler with you. He always let them know he was right where they were. He says that in Romans 15, Ephesians 6, Philippians 1, Colossians 4, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Thessalonians 3, and Philemon verse 22. Paul and other believers in Corinth and other places Learn to help each other in prayer. Look back at verse 11 of chapter 1. I want to show you another truth. And we're, of course, going to pick up on this uh, this evening. But 2 Corinthians 1.11, Paul shared his struggles. And as they shared their struggles with one another, they learned to share in bearing the load and sharing it through prayer. Difficulties should draw us closer to other Christians as we share our burdens. And difficulties are used by God to glorify himself. So when you find yourself in the trials of life, remember what God promised us and what he commanded us to do. Now, verse 11. Look, look how Paul writes to these dear Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 1.11. You also helping together in prayer for us. The thanks given by many people on our behalf for the gift granted us through many. But I want to focus on that little phrase, helping together. Fascinating word. The word, soon porgeo, means, that's translated helping together, is literally three words, with, under, and work. Paul just put the word with, under, and work. So if we said it in English, we'd say with under work. Sounds Unique, doesn't it? Well, that's what it sounded like to them. But what he means by that is that they were under his burden, working together with him so that he could accomplish what he needed to get done. He says, I, going through life, am so squashed, I'm so struggling that I cannot make it myself. I have the Lord. He never leaves me. But I need with under work. I need others who are helping together in prayer. Paul enlists the help of other believers to hold him up in his emotional, physical, and spiritual struggles. And this was in addition to the promise that he had that he wrote himself 
in Romans 8.26 that the Spirit also helps us in our infirmities as he intercedes for us. You see, Paul knew the Holy Spirit was interceding for him and helping him in his infirmities, yet he, he enlisted the help of others. Now, last place, 1 Thessalonians 5, okay? 1 Thessalonians, go to the right. 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. In this chapter, there are more imperatives or commands than in any other paragraph in God's Word. So, I mean, we're, we're, if you're a mining person or a drilling person, you would hit the mother load or a big pool, you know, if you were looking for treasures here. Because Paul reverts to short staccato kind of like commands like this you know kind of like when you're leaving the house you're going to catch the plane you say okay don't forget you know turn the sprinklers on and you know you know da -da -da -da, and feed the dog and water the you know and, and don't forget to pay the bills you know you just it's all those things you don't want them to forget paul says this is so important for you it's one of the clearest descriptions of the basic duties of a believer in christ church and we must take seriously paul's fifth sixth and seventh commands okay there are at least 19 of them uh, J. Vernon McGee found 22. I still can't find 22. I found 19. But however many there are, look at, at the fifth. It's in verse 14. And it says this, Comfort the faint-hearted. The word comfort in verse 14 is an imperative. Present, active, imperative. That means to continuously, actively be comforting. I command you to do that, Paul says. Comfort the faint-hearted. You know what that is? That means, uh, you've heard of oligarchy, the rule of the few. Well, it's the same word, the olig, which means few. And then suke, it's small or few-spirited. It's someone who we would call in the minor key. They're always down here. They're always kind of... Uh, uh, you know, are we downhearted? Yes, yes, yes. You know, the little song that we sing as kids. Uh, kids can sing it. Are we downhearted? No, no, no. Got my candy in my pocket and I'm okay, you know, because there's so few problems when you're little. But you don't find adults singing that song. And so it says, I command you, comfort those who are downhearted, who are faint-hearted, who are little-souled. In fact, the word comfort is very, I was telling someone this morning, it's a fascinating word. It's, it's to speak closely to them. It, it says, the, the word is to stand close to them and talk in their ear. It's kind of like if you ever get someone, you know, you, you notice that they get on the ledge, you know, when they're, when they're scared and they think they're going to fall and someone comes along and covers their eyes and says, come on, come back in the window, come back in, you know, don't look. And you stand by them and you talk them out of their imminent disaster. That's what this is. This is to speak closely to someone the faint-hearted and that's a commandment and that's why a couple of weeks ago in the evening service i said you know stand up and go by someone and ask them what you can pray for them about did you know that every time we come to a gathering of this assembly of god's saints that there are some oligosukes some small spirited people around us and you know what they need they need someone to stand close to them and talk to them and comfort them like Titus did when Paul was depressed, he was comforted by the coming of Titus, we saw in 2 Corinthians. The second commandment, uphold the weak. There's some people, Jude talks about them, that they have to be constantly pulled out of stuff. I mean, they, they're always collapsing, and they're always falling down. And you have got to, and I have got to, and we are commanded to uphold the weak. Why don't they get strong? They're in sin. He doesn't say that. Did you know that there are faint-hearted people, and there are always going to be faint-hearted people, and no matter how much you preach and pray, and how much you teach, and how much doctrine, I mean, they can memorize R.C. Sproul, and they will still be faint-hearted. And they can carry the biggest Bible. It's just part of how the church is made up. And that's why we have strong-hearted and we have the weak-hearted. And they are to minister to one another. The strong are not to point at all the weak and say... You went to two more Bible studies like I do, and you would not be like that, you know. And we just, we, we, and that is not very comforting to them. It, it says, talk in their ears to the faint-hearted, uphold the weak. And then look at the, the end of the 14th verse. Be, here's another command. It's the, the uh, seventh one in this line of 19 he gives. The end of verse 14, be patient with all. 
Be patient with the the ones who never have a problem and be patient with the ones who always have a problem. And you're always paramutheoing in their ear and always standing close to them and encouraging them. So, how though did Paul get out of these times? And how do we get out of these times? When, when we're pressed on every side and our emotions are caving in and we kind of feel like a submarine, you know, at the bottom of the ocean with the weight of the world on us, how do we get out? That's what, Saul, what Paul writes about, I mean, what David writes about in the 142nd Psalm. And that's what we're going to actually study tonight. He gives the pathway out of depression. He doesn't say how to avoid never having it, because you can't do that. He doesn't say how to beat up the people that have it, because it's going to happen. He tells how he learned in the cave, surrounded by troubles and 400 troubling people, with death at every corner outside with the king coming after him. David says in Psalm 142, I have found the way to make great discoveries about God when I'm down here in the cave. And that's what we'll study tonight. But before we go, I want you to turn in your hymn books with me to hymn number 26, because I couldn't mention this, Luther's testimony, without ending with it, okay? So hymn number 26, and we're going to say it, not sing it. We're going to say it. When you get to 26, you can stand with me. And before we go, I want you to listen to yourself confess with Martin Luther In 1527, in the darkest year of his life, when he was utterly paralyzed with depression, when he had ankefekshunk, or however you pronounce that word, he was gripped. In fact, in his journal, he wrote, For more than a week I was close to the gates of death and hell. I trembled in all my members, and Christ was wholly lost to me. That's what he wrote in his journal in 1527. And then he wrote this. Because he found the Lord was his refuge. Remember, that's what we're studying. We flee to him as our refuge. And he did it. And that's what we've been studying. Let's, let's say his testimony. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. And in his journal, by the way, he said at this point, he picked up, he was writing, and the devil was so distracting him with with, uh, these temptations, he picked up his inkwell and he threw it at the devil. He was so vivid to him. He, he, he just felt he was in the room and could see him, that Martin Luther threw his inkwell. And if you go to Wittenberg today, you can go up. It's called Lutherstadt today. I remember traveling there and getting out and going up. You can go up into his study, and there's still a black spot. They haven't painted it. I think they still blacken it, kind of like some of you do your hair. But it's still on the wall, and it reminded me of this. Okay, number two. Did we in our own strength confide... Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go. 
This mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. And for 19 years after he wrote that hymn, he battled with persistent, lifelong, melancholy, discouragement, and depression. But his hope was always in the Lord. Let's bow together. Father, our hope is in you. You, Lord Jesus, are our refuge. You do not remove the difficulties of life, the distresses, the discouragements, the depressions. You just make it so much sweeter in those times when we flee to you. For there in your embrace we find hope and joy and peace and strength to go on and to go back and to endure until you come or call. May we do that in your glorious name, that name that's above every name, we pray the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.